The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Advancing Treatment of Von Willebrand Disease, a visual exploration on personalizing care with current and emerging management strategies. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash NRZ 860. Hello, I'm Dr. Peter Quidis, the Medical Research Director of the Miriam Gulley Hemophilia Center in Rochester, New York, and also the Clinical Professor of Medicine at the University of Rochester School of Medicine. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this educational activity entitled Advancing Treatment of Von Willebrand Disease, a Visual Exploration on Personalizing Care with current and emerging management strategies. I'm very excited to participate in this activity because we're also going to be including a patient's journey through von Willebrand disease. So let's start with an overview of von Willebrand disease. And the person who deserves credit in part is a physician, though we want to also give credit for the index case. Her name was Horgis. And at that time, these two people met between a set of islands in Scandinavia where they uh, where Dr. Eric von Willebrand was assigned to take care of patients there with hematological disorders. Remember back then, all we knew about was hemophilia. So this was turned pseudo-hemophilia. The underpinning of this uh, disorder is really related, obviously, to the molecular basis of von uh, Willebrand's. BWF is a protein, and it's a very large protein. You can think about it as a string of beads. So basically, each bead is monomer, and if you have multiple monomers strung together, that's called a multimer. And the larger the multimer, the more of these monomers, the better the von Willebrand factor is going to be to uh, bind to platelets and bridge them to the site of bleeding with collagen in the subendothelial matrix. So the endothelial cell initially synthesizes the von Willebrands through a genetic blueprint. And this occurs within the endothelial cells and is stored in an organelle called the weibel bodies. And also it's produced and stored within the platelets. About 15% of our VWF is within the platelets. Initially, the monomers become dimerized and then they become two, four, six, eight. They keep expanding and that's called multimerization. And ultimately, when they're ready to be secreted out into the plasma, There's a key regulatory protein called ANIMS-13 that is going to break down some of the large strings of monomers. And again, it's a reminder that the ANIMS-13 is very important in cleaving the unusually large multimers. It's not a good thing for us to have an overaccumulation of these ULVWF, unusually large multimers, because that's going to lead to spontaneous platelet aggregation. But knowing this then allows us to then classify von Willebrands really into three main types. Type 1 and type 3 are basically deficiency states. They're a protein deficiency of von Willebrands being a protein that typically is going to be a mild deficiency type 1 or partial. And that's the majority of the patients that we see in clinical practice. And then about 1% of patients can have type 3 where they don't make any VWF at all. And then the next major category would be the type 2, and there's four types, and those are conditions where often you're making enough of VWF, but it doesn't work well, so it's a qualitative defect. Again, type 1 and type 3 are linked together because they're both a deficiency state. The pathway is that you're unable to either produce or secrete enough on Willebrands, that would be type 1, and typically the multimers are normal, but they're just decreased in number. And then if you have a major genetic mutation, you don't produce any type, any von Willebrands, and that would be the type 3. And that's where the markers for von Willebrands, the VWF antigen and the VWF risking cofactor activity, would be very low. The factor 8 level is very low in type 3 von Willebrands, akin to what you would see in a mild to moderate hemophiliac. And then we talked about this new subset of von Willebrands under type 1 that, again, they do produce enough of the antigen and have adequate antigen activity, but it only lasts for a short period of time because it's rapidly cleared. Whereas in type 2, it's just that the protein is just not normal. For type 2A, A stands for an abnormal multimer. They have a genetic defect that leads to 
a change where the multimers do not assemble appropriately and you lose the high and intermediate multimers. They're not going to be able to have as many binding sites for platelets. Whereas in type 2b, it's a gain of function where you actually don't have decreased binding to platelets, but increased binding that's going to soak up the von Willebrand's factor and led to a low level in the plasma. Whereas in 2M, you can bind to the platelets because there's a mutation that strategically prevents the VWF of binding to the platelets. Whereas in 2N, the defect is that they make normal von Willebrands, but there's a key mutation that prevents it from binding adequately to factor VIII. So you don't see any of the factor VIII on this molecule. We're now going to shift gears to the real world to a patient who has a severe uh, von Willebrands, which is really synonymous with type 3 von Willebrands. And Todd is going to share his journey from the time of the diagnosis was made in his family members to his life where he was early on given uh, various treatment options. Hello, I'm Todd Mosher. I have uh, severe von Willebrands disease. I was diagnosed with von Willebrands at birth. Previously, there were two siblings in our family that had been diagnosed with von Willebrands, so every child was checked after that. For my siblings that had von Willebrands, uh, they were three sisters. They had a, a tough time of the disease. My oldest one with von Willebrands disease, she died at age two with a small head injury, and uh, that's actually what alerted the doctors to the fact that we might have von Willebrands in our family. My second uh, sister with von Willebrands disease uh, contracted AIDS through the medicine she was getting for that in the early 80s and then in the mid 80s she died from complications due to AIDS. And my youngest sister uh, got hepatitis C from infusions which eventually led to serious problems with her liver and just recently uh, had a liver transplant. Back to the clinician's perspective of von Willebrands, it first starts with that initial assessment where we want to take a good history of bleeding symptoms from the patient. We also want to point out that you could also have similar symptoms based on other conditions such as hypothyroidism, and some medications can also cause acquired von Willebrands like Cipro, so you want to keep that in mind, as well as over-the-counter uh, medications so think of those other causes, but while you're doing that, you want to obtain a very thorough bleeding history, and that's using the bleeding assessment tool. And basically, we're looking at 12 domains of bleeding, beginning from nose bleeding to oral cavity, all the way to bleeding into the brain. So the bleeding assessment tool, however, is very helpful, and it gives you a sense that you're on the right path to diagnosing von Willebrands if they have a score above 5 in women above, you know, uh, two in children and above three in, you know, in men. So once uh, we do the assessment and the score is building up, we're suspicious that they could have von Willebrands, we then go on to laboratory testing. And this highlights the main tests that you're going to do. These are the top three. You're going to measure the amount of protein. You're going to measure the activity of the protein, typically with risacetin. The secondary role of von Willebrands is to prevent factor VIII from undergoing paralytic cleavage. So normally, in the severe form, the factor VIII level goes down often in the mild to severe hemophilia range. And this is a nice graphic showing you, as we talked about, the multimers are lost in 2A, the medium and high. See how they're lost? Whereas in 2B, you only lose really the high molecular weight. And in 2M and 2N, it's really normal, just like VWF, and you have to do additional testing. So assuming you have, you know, these tools available to test for von Willebrands, we then want you to keep in mind that there's a lot of nuances, including the fact that if the insurance company requires send-out testing, the results may be falsely low. Up to 40% of the time when someone sends out a von Willebrand testing to an outside laboratory, there's a lot of pre-analytical variables that can lead to a falsely low von Willebrands level. And again, one set is not enough. You really need more than one subnormal set of results. And then finally, roughly a third of patients with type 1, over time, their laboratory testing becomes normal. So there's an age-related increase in the levels. 
Uh, we still don't know if they also lose their bleeding phenotype. So uh, it's very important. The take-home message is uh, repeat testing, you know, every few years. So just putting it all together, before we talk about treatment, we certainly want to consider testing in someone where you have a high index of suspicion for von Willebrand's, either because they have an increased bleeding score or particularly in a young person, if there's a positive family history for von Willebrand's and they're facing surgery, this is the core testing you want to do. The amount of von Willebrand's, the activity, and the factor eight. And I was remiss to add that in type 2 von Willebrand's, often the platelet level is below normal. We're now going to shift gears uh, back to our patient, Todd, as we now talk about uh, treatment. And he's going to share with you his uh, initial treatments and issues he had in terms of the disease itself, in terms of uh, von Willebrand's causing complications over time. Up until age five, there were no treatments at all for me. Um, I guess one time I did have whole blood. But other than that, it was ice, crutches, ace bandages, uh, slings, immobility. That was really the treatment. The frequency of bleeds varied from time to time. Uh, Quite often, there were back-to-back bleeds, one right after the other, uh, days apart, maybe a week apart. Uh, A lot of the life was that. But typically, um, at least once a month, usually a little bit more. From age 5 to age um, 15, we did have access to crowd precipitate. Uh, We did not use it very often. We would only go in after something was very, very serious and the swelling was just huge and the pain was just too much. We would go to the hospital and get crowd precipitate. At age 15, the Hemophilia Center in Rochester convinced my parents to be trained and to have us trained to give our own infusions. Uh, Once we completed that, we were able to give on-demand infusions, and that was the plan. Whenever we had an injury or something, a bleed that required uh, an infusion, being able to do the on-demand treatment uh, was really a a huge change in our lives, um, largely in the aspect of pain and swelling. We never had to to wait till things got terrible to to deal with it. We would, uh, as soon as we started to have a bleed that started swelling and hurting, we would give the infusion and it would start to correct the problem. So that was a very huge change, but it didn't correct the frequency of the bleeds. It was exactly the same as it was before, just the duration of the bleed and the amount of pain that went along with that was greatly decreased. I continued on-demand treatment from age 15 up to age 30. And uh, because of all the bleeds that I'd had in my joints to that time, I had to have uh, corrective surgeries in both elbows so that uh, I could rotate my arms. I'd like to thank Todd for sharing his experiences. And we're now going to shift gears and finish up talking about treatment, essentially management, In discussing management, I find this timeline very helpful. It's a reminder that we've come a long way. In the early 80s, there was a pasteurized form of factor eight that contained von Willebrand's factor, termed HUMAP, and then they were able to improve the concentrates with those that had a lower amount of factor eight. And then ultimately, in 2015, von Vendy, a recombinant form of VWF was approved. Not all patients need replacement therapy, some of them could benefit from desmopressin or replacement. So that's a key principle. When we want to manage von Willebrand's, we can increase the level either by desmopressin, which is really confined to the type 1 patients who respond well, or we replace the level either with concentrate derived from the plasma or a recombinant von Willebrand's factor. And then we also want to raise the factor 8 level when appropriate, often particularly with type 2 and type 3 von Willebrand's. And then finally, a very important additional treatment that we use to stabilize the clot. You're going to prevent the body from breaking down the clot with plasmin by using these negatively charged polyanions, transamic acid or epsilon aminocaprosic acid, to bind to the positive lysine-rich Pringle domains of plasmin. I've been able to update guidelines for diagnosis and management since the 2008 National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute guidelines. There was an effort put together by four separate, very important groups that advocated and sponsored this, American Society of Hematology, International Society of Thrombosis Hemostasis, 
National Hemophilia Foundation and the World Federation of Hemophilia. Full disclosure, I was one of the 12 on the management panel. The participants were patients. So that really gives a greater teeth, greater perspective. And as a starting point in the guidelines, we kind of use these general principles about current therapies. And in general, if you have type 1, a valuable treatment option is often the use of a non-factor replacement strategy of trying to raise the VWF levels through desaminodesarginine vasopressin desmopressin, but often for major surgery, we typically would like to replace the von Willebrand's directly in that regard. For the type 2A, B, M, and N, you need to use concentrate as well as certainly for type 3. And now as an option for type 3 as well as type 2, we also have recombinant besides plasma derived. But really the workhorse for type 1 is often DDAVP, and it works often for patients undergoing minor surgery like a dental extraction or a skin biopsy, but not as well for major surgeries. It's futile to use it for type 3 because they have such a profound genetic mutation they can't make any von Willebrand's to release from the endothelium. And also in type 2B, it could lead to lowering of the platelet count as well as thrombosis theoretically. The way it works, again, as I mentioned, the DDAVP here is going to then release preformed stores of von Willebrand factor and factor 8. As we talk about factor replacement, now let's hear again from our patient who will share his current therapy for his von Willebrand's. At age 30, there were two changes to my treatment. I stopped using cryoprecipitate and uh, started using factor therapy. And at the same time, I changed from on-demand to prophylaxis treatment. I would give my uh, factor therapy three times a week. And that felt like a, uh, almost like a miracle in my life. Because from that point forward, I'll say, oh, I, I was basically normal. I'm sure my levels were way below normal, but they were so high for me that uh, I basically wouldn't get bleeds. Uh, maybe a couple of times a year, I'd have a breakthrough bleed. So I'm, I'm always careful with my insurance and things like that because I don't ever want to have to go back to not being able to take prophylaxis. As far as the VWF concentrates, remember patients with von Willebrand's usually have both low VWF and factor VIII, and when you replace von Willebrand's, the brands that are available have varying amounts of von Willebrand as well as factor VIII. They're VWF-containing factor VIII concentrates, essentially. And the goal for major surgery is to get that level in the 100% range, and as we opined in our guidelines for management, we want, for at least three days, levels in the 50% range or higher. And we want to be careful not to overshoot because of the risk of thrombosis. And we also want to be cognizant that some patients can bleed later. The four major concentrates available in the United States are listed here. Wolfactin is in the process of being available. The old war horse is HUMAP because that's been available for 30 years. But now we have Von Vendi that's made safely in a test tube with no worry about viral transmission. And it also contains unusually large multimers, which in the plasma, when we derive the plasma-derived VWF, they're not present because of the degradation that occurs. We do worry about the factor VIII in the concentrates in general because the plasma concentrates contain factor VIII, and guidelines don't want you to overshoot because of the risk for thrombosis. As I mentioned, historically for replacement, we use HUMAP, and many of us still use it because it's been around the longest with a very good safety profile. And again, the complications were not very common. And thanks to pasteurization, there really hasn't been any true transmission of hepatitis B or HIV. But again, there are challenges in using HUMAP. We also worry about the fact that over time, as there's more von Willebrand, particularly with a product like HUMAP, which has three times more VWF activity than factor VIII, the factor VIII level can really build up. What we typically have is the plasma-derived concentrates, which are the four I mentioned here. They are FDA-approved, and they can be used both for someone who's bleeding and also for perioperative management. And we can contrast those products to recombinant, which is synthetic, as I mentioned, and it's a purified product. This is recombinant. And what's nice is that it's not cleaved by M13 in the plasma, since so it's made in the test tube, not in the plasma, being harvested. So you end up having some of the high molecular weight multimers, which may, you know, lead to better efficacy in a longer half-life. Though the downside is, theoretically, if you have too much of these unusually large multimers, ultra-large multimers, it could lead to thrombosis. What's nice is that it's a really pure product without any animal or other human proteins. Dr. Joan Gill led a multi-center trial 
And what she showed is that there was very good control of bleeding. They had 100% had successful treatment with close to 100% having excellent efficacy and the remaining rated as good. And that also applied for minor bleeds and only two infusions median were needed. As far as mucosal bleeding, we reported very good results, as you can see in this table. And we believe that the results are very encouraging because this product has an increase in the ultra-large multimers. And you can compare HUMAP to recombinant VWF that has more of the unusually large multimers. And we showed that after infusion, Dr. Gill and, and our group showed that the proportion increased after the infusion, and then it declines over time. It was very well tolerated in the licensure trial. There weren't major adverse events, nothing that was life-threatening in that regard. And furthermore, no patient developed antibodies, which is often the bane of our existence in hemophilia care using factor VIII, the risk of developing antibodies. And there weren't any thrombotic events. In the licensure trial for the surgical indication, though, there was one DVT, though the investigator graded it as being unrelated. In general, we have learned from the initial licensure trials that it's very effective treatment to replace with recombinant protein. Importantly, the half-life is extended, probably because you have these unusually large multimers that confers a longer half-life, going from average 12 to 15 hours to about 21 hours, a little bit more. And again, factory rate gets stabilized. And what's nice is that even though initially in someone with a very low factor rate level, typically below 40%, you have to concurrently infuse recombinant factor rate, but if it's above 40%, you don't. And again, the factor A level starts being produced by the endothelial cells because you have enough on Willebrands. Based on this study, it did receive a FDA approval for management of preoperative bleeding. And again, there are advantages to using the recombinant product because it's completely synthetic, made in a test tube. So in a young family, particularly if their offspring had suffered or passed away from HIV or hepatitis C, it's very reassuring to use this product. And given that increase in half-life by maybe six to eight hours, it does become a very interesting agent to use for prophylaxis. Maybe you could get by with just dosing once or twice a week as opposed to three times a week. So we're very excited about this product and a number of us are involved in generating more data because without data, it's going to be hard to you know, move forward in using these new licensed products. It can be difficult to, you know, dose for surgery because if you don't get factor eight, you're not immediately going to have a rise in the factor eight, though the factor eight level does rise by about 6% per hour. So it does rise over time if you give it the night before surgery. But for major surgery, you want to give both the recombinant VWF as well as recombinant factor eight. It is a new product, so cost is an issue. Prophylaxis has been a topic very dear to my heart. And our first study was to do a registry to find out how many patients with severe von Willebrand's, mostly type 3, are on prophylaxis. And what we found was that there are more patients in Europe than in the United States, interestingly. And the common indication was mostly for joint bleeding. And then after that study, we then did a retrospective chart review and showed that VWF replacement with plasma derived factor was quite effective in reducing respectively nose, GI, joint, and menstrual bleeding. Then finally, we did a prospective study and what they showed was that over time, if you gave it weekly, you could be just once a week, you could prophylactically prevent nose bleeding, and then two times, three times, and then every other day is shown here. So there is a role for prophylaxis. Again, this was the prospective study of randomized prophylaxis that did show benefit. And again, this is in this year's guideline panel 2021. We do advise strong consideration for prophylaxis in the patient who has a history of severe and frequent bleeding in that regard. Regard. And when we put together these guidelines, we did not have data from using recombinant VWF, but that data is being generated, and we look forward to seeing this eventually published in that regard. Finally, I would like to circle back to our patient, Todd, and he's going to emphasize the importance of patient care being a two-way street with the provider and the patient with communication being very critical. Looking back, it's uh, kind of funny to think uh, what I was feeling and thinking at the time when uh, the doctors were trying to get me to move to a prophylaxis treatment. I was uh, very resistant at first, actually. My sister had died due to AIDS complications, 
from the factor therapy. So I was avoiding that. I was staying with the um, crowd precipitate for as long as possible. Um, they talked to me many times about different things, about the safety, about all the, the things that the pharmacies were doing to ensure the safety of the uh, products. And so I eventually just said, okay, let's do it. And uh, it, was, it was a very wonderful thing. They, they kept close watch on me at, at the beginning to see how, how, the, um, how that was working. They would have me come in several times, uh, take my blood, make sure that my levels were right, that the right dosing was being done. A lot of checking, a lot of checking on how I was doing, if it was working for me. But it's very important to, to trust the medical team that you have uh, because it's really the quality of life depends on it. And uh, the team that I have uh, where I live is wonderful. And I pretty much go day to day without noticing or caring. I give my prophylaxis treatment. And other than that, 20 minutes, three times a week doing that, uh, I don't even have a care in the world about uh, my von Willebrand's disease. Because I'm so well cared for by the hemophilia center, I don't have uh, lots of needs, lots of need to research uh, and explore uh, new things on my own. They do provide um, resources for us. There's a, a, a magazine that they uh, make sure that I get all the time. And I get um, emails from the National Hemophilia uh, foundation uh, with all sorts of updates on what's going on, what's new in the world, which what are the medical breakthroughs. So it's nice to stay on top of things. Lastly, this is a reminder that good clinical care is a two-way street. We need to work closely as a provider with the patient and vice versa. And with such shared decision-making, there's no question we can improve patients' lives with von Willebrand's from having from those with type 1 to those who have type 2 and type 3. I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash NRZ 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Takeda Pharmaceuticals USA Incorporated. This activity is accredited by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI. Peerview Institute for Medical Education.